Welcome, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. I don't have any disclosures, and these are the obligatory slides. I don't think I need to read them. All right, so um, learning objectives. I just wanted to review. So I'm going to really focus on outpatient therapeutics. I'm not going to focus on inpatient therapeutics for COVID-19. And then a review eligibility and contraindications to therapy. And then some workflows that you can I, that I was going to suggest in terms of how to optimize things in your clinic. So, and, but I'd actually like to hear from you about how you're doing it as well. And then review treatment for preventing COVID-19 disease. Since treatment was available for the outpatient setting, we've actually cycled through a number of different things. And I just put this up there, given our usual timeline for creating therapeutics for things like HIV is a much slower timeline than antivirals for COVID. And so even uh, the ones that we've had very early on, Cerevimab, Devimab, and Banlamibavab, these are all a lot of MABs, mouthful of MABs, but they don't actually, we're no longer active against the subsequent variant. So we've seen even with Citrovimab and then with Delta variant that that came the main one. And then with Omicron, that one no longer worked. And so we have definitely gone through a number of different therapeutics and I'll go through which ones we are available today and how effective they are. So I wanted to talk about the emergency use authorization criteria for treating someone in the outpatient setting for COVID-19. And then the different tiers that the NIH uses to determine you know, who is in periods of where there may not be adequate access to therapeutics, who should we really prioritize for those therapeutics and who may not be as high risk. So the EUA indication from all of these therapeutics for the outpatient setting are essentially the same. Patients with mild to moderate disease who are within a defined period of onset of symptoms, five to seven days, and are at high risk for developing severe COVID-19 disease. So over the course of this pandemic, we have seen certain uh, people with certain diseases be at higher risk for more severe disease. And a lot of these studies were actually done pre-vaccination. So I do wanna put that caveat in there. Tier one and NIH criteria are the people who are going to be the most high risk. And that's our immunocompromised individuals. And I put this up here because as we know, there are varying degrees of immunocompromised states. One would argue that all of our of patients that we see who are living with HIV are in this category. But actually I do wanna call out some specific language around moderate and severely immunocompromised individuals who are in this tier one category. So CDC and NIH define severe as someone with HIV with a CD4 count less than 50, which is interesting. Moderate is anyone with advanced or untreated HIV. And that term advanced is sort of up to the interpreter, but otherwise we typically use that as someone with an AIDS diagnosis, potentially someone with a low, and that's how I've been interpreting it, someone with a lower CD4 count, such as below 200. So our tier one HIV, my interpretation based on the NIH and CDC guidance is really anyone with a CD4 count less than 200, and particularly patients who are untreated HIV are also in that category. And nowadays, you know, given that so many people are virologically suppressed, the people that are not tend to have a lot of other potential risk factors as well for why they're not suppressed. And then unvaccinated individuals who are of older age, so greater than 75 or greater than 65 with any additional risk factors, they are our highest risk. And we know that people who are older have a much higher morbidity mortality from COVID-19. And so who's in the other categories? So tier two are unvaccinated individuals who are not included in tier one. Essentially, people who are greater than 65 or under 65 with additional risk factors. And additional risk factors are defined by the CDC, but that could even mean a BMI of 
30 or higher. So there are a lot of people that are potentially included if they're unvaccinated in this group. And then tiers three and four really focus on vaccinated individuals with additional risk factors. And so tier three is our older patients, tier four is our younger patients who are vaccinated but may have additional risk. In terms of the EUA criteria, all four of these tiers actually are eligible under the emergency use authorization for these therapeutics to receive therapy. The reason I put this up there is because if like many of us are struggling with staffing more so than the actual medications and some areas may not have as many medications. So who should, to whom should you put all most of your resources? And I think tier one and tier two are really the where you may see a significant benefit from offering therapeutics. So a case here, a 47-year-old woman with HIV, CD4 count of 650, viral load undetectable, calls your office after testing positive by a home rapid antigen test for COVID. She endorses a new cough, fever, headache, and has been feeling short of breath when just walking around her apartment, but she does have a pulse ox at home and she's 97%. She's vaxxed and boosted. She doesn't have any other problems besides her HIV and her BMI is 25 on her last clinic visit. She reports that her symptoms have been going on for about two days, and she's only on alvitegravir, cobacistat, and FTAF. So in terms of when, how we approach people who may be eligible for treatment, I like to think about disease severity first, because this is how you triage a patient to determine, okay, not only do they, are they eligible for therapeutics, but also are they sick enough that they need more urgent care to come in and have an office visit or even go to the emergency department. So in terms of this patient's severe, severe uh, disease severity, it's not very significant. She does have some short, some subjective shortness of breath, but it looks like her oxygen levels are okay. And then we look at the risk factors. So as I mentioned, all the EUA criteria, you have to have a risk factor, except if you're over 75, which is the risk factor itself, because CDC says 65 and over is a risk factor. So does this person have a risk factor? HIV is a risk factor. And so does this patient need therapy? So it's really important when I talk about the severity of disease that I want to make a distinction between no symptoms and mild symptoms. And there is a difference. People that are asymptomatic do not need this therapy and they are not eligible for this therapy. So if they just happen to test positive, like for a pre-op screening, it comes up or they're going on a trip and they test positive. We don't know how long they've actually tested positive and they don't have any symptoms to mitigate with the use of antivirals or monoclonal antibodies. So I wanna say that no symptoms does not equate to needing therapy. The progression of symptoms, mild, moderate, severe, and critical, anybody with severe and critical should not be obviously getting outpatient COVID therapeutics. So risk factors for disease progression, I wanted to put this up there because many of our patients, even though they have well-controlled HIV, may have a lot of other risk factors for, develop, for being at risk for more severe disease. And that could just be age. It could be obesity or diabetes or kidney disease or heart disease. Really, the, the comorbidities are pretty broad that are considered higher risk. And there is a CDC link that I give to providers to help them sort of figure out what are the risk factors. There have actually been some additional data about mental health issues like schizophrenia that have also been associated with higher risk for disease progression, and then also opiate use disorder. So people with substance use disorder, there have been a couple of studies to show that those patients actually do worse with COVID as well. And lastly, people who are living homeless, there's also a signal for um, them doing worse as well, and probably a marker for not being in care and probably having other undefined or un recognized comorbidities. So here you can see the more conditions you have, they're cumulative and they increase your risk of developing more severe disease and death. And so you can add up those comorbidities and they get more points and meaning that they're a higher risk. And then the link in this slides is actually the link to that complete list of conditions that are high risk for COVID-19 severe disease. So this patient has mild to moderate disease, she has HIV, and she is eligible for treatment. So I just wanna know what would people offer? This is, I didn't really make a poll, so I just wanna know 
I'm sure many of you have been called because this is now I would what, what I would call the last month or two has been the outpatient surge, not the inpatient surge, but the outpatient surge for sure, where we have, you know, thousands of people calling in and to ask for COVID therapeutics or to talk about mild to moderate COVID. So in this scenario, what would people use? Okay, Rod, thanks for chiming in. I can't say the drug name. I have to use the, I mean, the trade name, even though it's a lot easier, but the oral antiviral, yes, ritonavir and nerm, I, I can't even pronounce it. It's got too many R's and M's and N's. The goal of treatment is to really avoid death and hospitalization. We don't actually have data on reducing duration of symptoms and reducing transmission with these antivirals. And that's what I want to point that out. So this is really for the individual benefit of reducing the risk of progression to severe disease. These are the NIH uh, guidance, and it's best essentially for patients who don't require hospitalization or supplemental oxygen. So those with mild to moderate disease who have risk factors should be offered treatment. And there are a couple of treatments that we're going to go through. So ritonavir boosted nermatrelvir or remdesivir, which is only available IV, or babtilovimab, which is IV, and then molnupiramir. It does recommend against using steroids in the absence of any other indication for treatment of mild to moderate COVID. Um, and these are just the drug targets. Bevtilovimab, which is our current monoclonal antibody for treatment, it does work at the viral entry point. Nermatrelvir, ritonavir, we, we are very familiar on this group with ritonavir. These are protease inhibitors and the ritonavir acts just like it does with other HIV protease inhibitors to boost the levels of the primary drug. So it's not really the primary drug, it's just serving as the booster. And then we have a remdesivir and molnupiravir, which are also antivirals working at later on in the replication cycle. And so we have uh, those medications. And then the other one, which is also a mouthful, um, tixagavimab and asolgavimab, that one is for prevention, which we'll talk about later. Okay, so Rod chose this drug, um, the protease inhibitor for treatment of uh, mild to moderate COVID. And the indication again is for, this is from the EUA, the emergency use authorization from the FDA for non-hospitalized patients. We have, I will put the caveat, used it for hospitalized patients who have mild disease who are admitted for something else. As I mentioned, it's a protease inhibitor. Its dosing is three tablets twice a day for five days. And really it's based on this study, Epic HR, that I'll go through. And I want, the only point I wanna make about this slide is that the patients who are enrolled, which was thousands of patients, thousand in the treatment arm, thousand in the placebo arm, and the primary outcome was hospitalization or death at any cause at day 28. I want to mention that these patients were not vaccinated and it had a risk factor. And you can see here in this Kaplan-Meier graph that curve that patients who got the protease inhibitor combination had significantly less death or hospitalization. It was an 88% reduction. And the main adverse effect that we're seeing is some nausea. And they actually just updated their EUA fact sheet to include a nausea, which I'm surprised they didn't before because all of us know that ritonavir can cause nausea. And then the other thing is dysgeusia, which is an altered taste. And this can be really bad. Patients have told me it feels like they put gasoline in their mouth. It's that bad. And so I've preemptively started talking about using cough drops or hard candies for right after you take it, because the taste is really bad for the generally the first hour after taking it. There are a number of drug-drug interactions, and many of you are experts at the drug-drug interactions for this already because we um, deal with it for protease inhibitors. So it's very similar to what, when we use boosted darunavir medications, it has all the same kind of side effects. And so the main things that we think about in the outpatient setting are a direct oral anticoagulants, but then there's a number of them, as you can see, like any of our transplant medications, those meds, you can't really hold those medications safely. And so there are things that we can hold. So like the statins, 
it's not urgent that they be on that stat. And so we can actually ask them to hold that. And then you can, you know, favor using the protease inhibitors for treatment and avoid the drug drug interaction that way. What about in this patient who's already on copacistat? What would you do? Because they're already on a booster. And these come co formulated. So you can't take out the ritonavir and we don't actually, that's not really recommended anyway. Great. So our pharmacists are chiming in appropriately that you can actually just continue. Even if you're on a, um, you know, boosted Darunavir with, uh, with Kobe, you can actually just continue that cobacistat and it, exactly advise that they may have more nausea or preemptively prescribe an anti-emetic in this situation is exactly right. So this should not deter you from using um, the protease inhibitor for treatment in these patients and, and just tell them they may have more nausea. So the other thing is, so now that you've determined treatment, I wanted to bring up the COVID therapeutics locator. Have many of you use this as a resource for prescribing? It is excellent. So many patients don't want to come all the way to the hospital-based pharmacy where we work to get this prescription. And you can have you can identify pharmacies locally that they can go pick it up at. And the supply has greatly improved. And so many pharmacies, uh, it's it's inevitable that they would have a pharmacy in their look in their area that would carry their matrovir, ritonavir. Okay, what about bebtilovimab? So bebtilovimab is a monoclonal antibody, laboratory-created monoclonal antibody that binds to spike protein. It is also has the same indication, and it's dosed IV times one. And it's based on this data, but I will say that this is not really complete because it was with banlovimab, adesivimab, and bebtilovimab together. We don't actually have data for bebtilovimab that is in humans. We know that in vitro, it worked against BA1, BA2 subvariants. We do not have data for BA4, BA5, which is why NIH dropped this down to as a secondary, not the uh, first line therapy, but second line therapy. We reserve bebtilovimab really for patients who cannot get the protease inhibitor combination because of drug-drug interactions and that which cannot be stopped. And that tends to be just our transplant population. So our tier one, tier two folks that cannot go off there and immunosuppression. Molnupiravir. So this is another backup. This one is a nucleoside analog pro drug, and it is it has the same indications. It's also five days. The main thing to know about this is that it's not recommended in pregnancy. And if they are going to use it during lactation to dump the breast milk, because there is a concern about toxicity to the fetus. The benefit of this one is that you can use it with abnormal renal function and there aren't significant drug drug interactions. But as I present here, the benefit of molnupiravir over placebo is actually not nearly as good as with the protease inhibitor combination. And so it is really second line for that reason. And I reserve this only for tier three, tier four patients who cannot get the protease inhibitor combination for whatever reason. I would not give this to our tier one, tier two patients just because we know that the efficacy is not as good. What about remdesivir? Remdesivir is also considered actually a first line therapy, but there are logistical issues with offering remdesivir. And I'd like to hear from the group if they're offering it because it is a three daily IV treatments in outpatient settings. So this is not remdesivir we've used for quite some time in the inpatient setting for severe COVID. There was a, a large trial that was done in New England Journal, published in New England Journal the, called the Pine Tree Study that looked at it for mild to moderate disease, but only three days of treatment. And it showed a significant reduction also on the order of high 80s percent reduction in hospitalization or death. So equivalent to the protease inhibitor combination, but clearly, you know, five days of pills versus coming in three days in a row for IV therapy is logistically a bit different. 
before I get into pre-exposure prophylaxis, I did want to comment on Rod's comment here about the renal issues with Paxlovid. So Paxlovid comes in two different doses. One is the for GFR greater than 60, and one is for GFR between 30 and 60. And you have to know which formulation you want when you order it. For GFR less than 30, it's contraindicated. So that is an important thing to know when you're thinking about how to when to order that and who may be who, who for whom it may be a contraindication. The EUA fact sheet actually doesn't say there's a required creatinine. And so, which can be a barrier for many patients to get it if they haven't had recent labs. Many of our patients during the pandemic haven't come in for labs as we know. And so if there aren't risk factors and their last creatinine was normal, I would go ahead and recommend just using the full dose. If there are any concerns for abnormal renal function, then I would probably use an alternative um, regimen if the concerns are significant or if they've had documented abnormal renal function in the past. All right, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So this is a mouthful. I'm going to call it the name that it is, which is Evisheld, which is what everyone uses, um, including the HRSA website. So, but um, so this is our only pre-exposure prophylaxis available. As I will note, there is no post-exposure prophylaxis that is currently that currently works. We used to be able to use the other monoclonal antibodies for post-exposure prophylaxis, but they are no longer authorized uh, given our lack of efficacy with Omicron. And this, this product has not been uh, evaluated for post-exposure prophylaxis. So it is a two separate injections of three mils. So these are huge volumes of injection and we do not have really good data, real world data for Omicron and its benefit in Omicron. But I will, I bring this up today because the FDA EUA fact sheet was just updated this week. We've been long awaiting to hear when they would recommend repeat doses and now repeat dosing every six months is recommended. Even though this medication was studied in patients with risk factors who were unvaccinated, that is not who we use it for. We are, the FDA EUA is for people who have moderate to severe immunosuppression or immunocompromised or unable to receive vaccine due to a significant adverse event or allergy or concern with the vaccine. And you can see here, um, this data represents, again, people who with risk factors who were unvaccinated. So not really the population we actually use it in the most. We've treated a few thousand patients within our system, and almost all of them are on heavy immunosuppression or transplant patients who are on immunosuppression. In terms of HIV, like I mentioned, the moderate to severe people with HIV um, immunosuppression, so that would be below 50 or uh, CD4 count below 50 or below 200 or untreated, if we wanna talk about moderate. And you can see that initially this was not studied in Omicron. There was a 77% reduction in symptomatic COVID disease. I will tell you plenty of our patients who've gotten this product have gotten COVID in, um, with BA2 um, or BA4, BA5, although their disease is relatively mild. So here is like the recap here. I just wanted to show it because I know I'm way over time just to show kind of the relative efficacy in the populations where we sort of recommend use in the formulation. So our mechanism of action, if that's helpful. I know that's a lot, but thank you. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.